here at the book of Exodus. We're going to go through some of these questions, and uh, we'll also do just uh, a kind of uh, conceptual view in terms of what we learn in Exodus as it relates to our um, application and understanding of the New Testament. And so uh, we'll just hit a couple of these questions, and uh, any questions that you have from these questions or otherwise, and then, uh, like I said, we'll go into uh, some more application-based um, views of this book. And so, uh, one-word book summaries of Genesis and Exodus. So, reminds me a little bit of Pew Packers. He's bringing us back to the former book, uh, just to make sure that we don't uh, forget what we've already studied. Um, you might remember how we manage the Pew Packers. Uh, we move on to additional cards and additional memory work and understanding of the Bible. And uh, then the young ones will say, Wait a second, we've studied the newest material. We haven't studied that older material yet. Uh, well, remember, we want to uh, not forget what we've already looked at. Uh, a Bible student's life is cumulative. You think about students sometimes, uh, college courses, high school courses, etc. They say, hey, is the test going to be cumulative? What are they asking? Uh, is it going to come from all the material we've studied uh, so far? Well, a Bible student, our life is is constantly learning the Bible, but it's cumulative in that we're constantly building on what we've already learned. And so uh, Genesis, remember its origination, the book of origination. Um, obviously, we see the creation there. Uh, we see the origination of the nations. Uh, we see God's origination in terms of dealing with man and dealing with sin, um, the origination of his uh, eternal promises. Think about Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Uh, well, then the book of Exodus, organization, organization. Um, so the one-word book summary of Genesis, origination, Exodus, uh, organization. Uh, what lesson did God teach Israel to help prepare them for Jesus? What lesson did God teach Israel to help prepare them for Jesus? So I think there's probably a couple ways you can answer this, and some of this may spill over actually into some of the other questions. Uh, but you have the theme of Genesis which is obviously relevant to this question. Uh, God's nation is bound by law. God's nation is bound by law. Are we, I uh, remember in the New Testament, uh, we are the uh, Israel of God. Are we bound by law? Are we bound by law? Is there a law of Christ? Sometimes people say, well, the Old Testament, you find law. The New Testament, well, that's just grace. It doesn't have anything to do with law. That's just totally false. Um, and remember, we are the nation of God or the Israel of God. I reference there Galatians chapter 6 and verse 16, uh, the Israel of God. And so uh, the New Testament, we are under uh, or are identified as a nation. You think also what Peter states, for example. Uh, go over there to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to, uh, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then drop down as well to verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. And so we also are a nation. Um, and are we bound by law just as they were being trained that they were bound by law as well? The answer to that question is yes. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Uh, let's start by going to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let's look there, verse 21. Uh, Paul states there, actually we'll start at verse 19. Someone could read for me verses 19 through 21 of 1 Corinthians 9. 19 through 21, 1 Corinthians 9. Yes, sir. And though I am chief in all men, I made myself a servant to all, that I might win you all. I choose Jews over sinners, as a Jew, that I might win you. To those who are under the law, under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Those who are without law, as without law, not being without law for God, but for Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Okay, and so Paul here is making an argument concerning the way in which he evangelized. He sought to identify with the lost. He sought to recognize their perspective, where they come from, um, how they view themselves, and sought to then find ways in which he could align with them in those regards, yet always being bound by the law of God. And here he specifies actually the law of Christ. 
And so, is there a law within uh, God's New Testament nation? Absolutely. And so, we see the beginning stages of God training mankind in that respect here in the book of, of Exodus. Uh, God has always had law in the way in which he deals with uh, his creation. Even in the garden, right? God had law. Um, and that was, that was, that was specified. Um, here we have now the law of Moses being instituted. Look also just as reference, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, uh, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so is there a law in the New Testament? Again, what will our denominational friends say? What will the majority of casual Bible students say? Well, you know, the God of the Old Testament, he had law and he was so strict and obedience this and obedience that. But the God of the New Testament, you know, we're all just saved by grace and it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's inaccurate. That's false. It's error. Uh, the New Testament, there is a law. It's the law of Christ and we are bound by it just as they were bound. And we see how God expects his law to be fulfilled. We see here in this very book what happens when God's law is not abided in. Uh, there's punishment. Uh, there are consequences. Uh, there is destruction. Uh, there is wrath. And man has to deal with God's wrath when a man does not abide in the law that God has delivered. Now, it is interesting because we do understand, um, you know, you think about, for example, uh, the gospel according to John, and, and some of those references regarding grace. Um, how is it that we find the fulfillment of God's graciousness to mankind under the New Testament? Uh, well, it's the way in which man could be reconciled back to God via the blood of Christ. Man has done nothing to deserve that plan. We don't uh, get an opportunity to be reconciled to God and can never earn it. But yet, by grace, God has provided that plan to us. Now, we must abide in it, uh, and that graciousness is um, something that uh, has been uh, defined and identified, but it is within law that we tap into the graciousness of God. As a matter of fact, it is by the graciousness of God that he has provided to us law. Look at Titus chapter 2. Notice here in verse 11 beginning, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Okay? God's grace that brings salvation, appeared to all men. At what point did that come? Via the gospel of Christ. At that point now, God's plan of salvation was finalized. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Well, what does the graciousness that's appeared to all men do? And it, it is law, law of Christ. Well, what does it do? Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world. What a life-altering mentality to have to recognize, I don't deserve the commandments and regulations of God. I'm undeserving of those. Yet he's given them to me. Again, far different in the way in which the denominational world sees all this. And so um, we find here that God teaches Israel to prepare them for Jesus that his nation is bound by law. His nation is bound by law. And then number three there as well, how is Jesus characterized uh, in this book? And I think this is also connected to question two. Um, Jesus is the Lamb of God for sinners slain. The Lamb of God for sinners slain. And you think about uh, God's Old Testament people being prepared regarding sacrifices and, and bringing about a, a lamb without blemish. Um, and then you look at what John the baptizer states, as John the apostle writes, in John chapter 1 and verse 29, he says, he sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so, what are they being trained in? Uh, they're being trained that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. They're being conditioned into this. Let me ask you a question. Um, is it hard to condition people? Is it hard to kind of get people to change behavior, to recognize new things? It, it's hard to get children to change behavior, and they've not even really lived much on this earth yet. And yet to get them to do things differently is very, very challenging. We recently had a new system implemented at work, a system meaning like a policy, the way we're going to do things. And they communicated and communicated. I mean, for like a year nearly, they've communicated, communicated. We're going to do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. 
Now all of a sudden we're here and it's like everybody's confused. Nobody knows. Why? Because for so long we've done a certain way, done a certain way. It doesn't matter all those communications. I mean, people are just conditioned. It's like, boom, this is what I do, right? Um, it, it's kind of like you ring the bell, the dog eats food. You ring the bell, the dog eats food. Well, after so long you've done that for such a period of time, people are just conditioned. Okay, so what's God done with his creation? God has conditioned them via the sacrifices of lambs, via uh, the shedding of blood to connect with that, what? Forgiveness. To connect with that sin and a sin problem. Okay? And so imagine now the mindset of an Israelite, uh, of, of a child of God's Old Testament people, and all of a sudden, John E. Mercer says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Boom. Their mind goes now to what they've been trained in, what they've been conditioned in uh, throughout their life. Okay? So how is Jesus characterized in the book? Any questions or thoughts at this point? Book of Exodus. All right. Uh, let's go through a few more here, and then I want to spend some time, like I said, making some parallels uh, and application to us today. Um, holistically, when we think about the book. Uh, what is the three-point outline of the book? He's got that laid out for us here in his second section where he says structure of the book, his three-point outline here, deliverance of God, chapters 1 through 19, directions of God, chapters 20 through 24, dwelling of God, chapters 25 through uh, 40. Um... And I don't know if we'll get down here. We won't get down probably to question 17. So let's just go ahead and look at this as well. I thought this was a good way to kind of describe this. Um, if you look at number 8 there under survey of the book, <coughs> he says, in the book of Genesis, God walked with his people, but now God wants to dwell with his people. This is why the tabernacle is built. And we're going to specifically look there at that uh, appendix that he has on the tabernacle. Um, we've done a study of this before, but we'll look at it again as well. Um, I think Steve even has recently gone through it um, and see the connection between the different aspects of worship and the way in which the tabernacle was managed, translated over to the New Testament. Um, and so we'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. Um, so three-point outline of the book. Number five, what world empire controls Israel in the book? We studied this initially, right? Egypt, uh, we're aware of that. Um, what change occurred in Egypt that resulted in the slavery of Israel? I mean, I think actually there's two probably here with this, right? Um, number one, there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, right? Um, so Joseph was in line with Pharaoh, uh, was, was serving under Pharaoh's household, and then rose up one, hey, you know what, he doesn't know Joseph, right? So you have a, a shuffling of the deck from a political perspective, if you will, and so now all of a sudden, God's people, they don't have a, a say at the table. <laughs> their, their voice is disregarded now. Um, but not only do you have uh, Joseph and, and God's people being kind of excluded, what else do you have that's, that's probably a, a big reason as to why um, changes occur? God's people grew, <laughs> Right? Um, when the people of God came into Goshen, there were only 70, but when they came out of bondage, they numbered around 1 million. Right? And we, we notice that. Pharaoh is aware. Pharaoh says, wow, this people's growing. They're going to become uh, more numerous than us. They can overtake us. And so what are we going to do? We're going to make them serve with rigor. Uh, and so you see a major change there. Um, from what tribe was Moses? Senator of Levi there, number 10, A, number 2. Um, and then he's got wife of Moses, father-in-law of Moses, brother and sister of Moses. Again, I'll mention there, father was Amram, mother was Jochebed, brother was Aaron, sister was Miriam, uh, his wife was Zipporah. Uh, those are all something we're probably familiar with. Um, what name did God use to identify himself before Moses? Now, this is important when you think about how Jesus identifies himself in the New Testament. Uh, what does God say regarding his name? He's talking to Moses. Moses says, who do I say sent me? I am. I am. You tell them I am sent you. Well, that's making a statement, isn't it? Look there at Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. 
Uh, and you see Moses asking the question, uh, verse 13. Uh, he says, and they, say, they shall say to me, what is his name? Uh, what shall I say unto them? Um, I mean, this is huge. God answers and responds, uh, I am that I am. I mean, it's just, it's almost like, I almost get it in a way, like, how dare you even ask the question? <laughs> I mean, I'm eternal. I am sent you. That's who sent you. Um, I mean, you can't trump this designation. Uh, you can't in any way identify in, in a light that's more powerful and, and more significant. God identifies himself as I am. Uh, now, why and, and how does this connect then to the New Testament? Um, Let's go over to, and by the way, you think about the book of John. book of John, you have the eight I am's. Uh, Jesus, I am the bread, I am the light, I am the way, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection, I am the vine, I am the door. Look at John 8 and verse 24. Um, remember, when the English translation occurred, uh, Time, at times they would add an italicized word, like in the King James you'll see like an italicized word at times. That italicized word is saying that the word could be implied because there is not a direct translation from the, from the Greek to the English. And so you have that here in John 8 and verse 24, and it is incorrectly provided. should not be there. Okay? John 8, verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, there is no he, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Uh, what is Jesus saying here? <laughs> he's saying he, he's God. He's eternal. I uh, had a study with Muslim before, and Muslim said, well, you know, Jesus never states that he's God. Oh, that's not, that's incorrect. It's false. John 8, great example. I mean, how much more plain could Jesus have been, verse 58? Did they understand what Jesus meant? Absolutely. Look how they responded. John 8, verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> What's he saying? I'm eternal. I'm God. How do they understand that? Well, they took up stones, cast at him. They understand what Jesus is saying. They know exactly what he's saying. Jesus claimed deity, absolutely. And, that, and that's important, again, especially with uh, Muslims, they will say that he did not. Um, any, uh, any questions or thoughts? All right. Uh, what is the Passover feast? What is the Passover feast? And what is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? So you have the Passover Feast. Passover Feast is literally a meal. It's a meal. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, verse 6, uh, verse 11, verse 14. It is a meal. And then you have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and that lasted several days. It was a week. Um, verse 17, and then 15 through 16 there of Exodus chapter 12. Um, and again, associated there with God's deliverance of his people out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, what kind of discipline did God use with Israel in Exodus? We'll look at this in just a few minutes, I think. Um, what chapter 10 commandments listed? Yeah, that's a, that's a pew packers question, right? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And uh, pop quiz. I think Steve had a pop quiz recently on band. I haven't taken it yet. I need to take that. Uh, 10 commandments of Israel. How many of those commandments are found in the New Testament? Pop quiz, anybody know? Nine, that's right, nine. Which one is not found in the New Testament? Sabbath, uh, that's right. Is the Sabbath, by the way, is that an eternal commandment, meaning it's not connected to the law of Moses? Important question. Uh, no, it is not. Look there, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
Um, and let's read here. Someone can read for me verses uh, 6 through uh, 16. 6 through 16. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Through 16. Mm -hmm. For if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stone, was glorious, so that the children of Israel did not look heavily at the place of labor as a reward of the promise, this glory is passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of the ministry of righteousness much more in glory. Even when what even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that is felt. But if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, we have such hope, and with great boldness to speak. So I know this, so that they all will escape, so that the children of Israel should not look heavily at the stone of what was passing away. That their mind was for this day the same day remains kept unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in the Old But even to this day, when Moses was read, the veil lies in their heart. Nevertheless, when one speaks to the Lord, the veil is taken away. All right, so the keeping of the Sabbath is provided in the Ten Commandments. It's on the tablets. And yet, when Moses comes down from the mountain, his face is shining, the veil is worn. But Paul says over and over again, that's going to be fading away. That's not going to remain. So if you ever get in a study with a Seventh-day Adventist who says the Sabbath is an eternal commandment, here we go, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's not fading away. It's part of the Old Testament, as actually Paul states specifically there, if you note there in verse 14. Uh, so it's not segmented off on its own, like Seventh-day Adventists try to claim. Um, there's question 15. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on and have uh, an application concerning the overall picture of Exodus. And so obviously the book of Exodus means what? The way out or departure. And what were they exiting from? Egyptian bondage. They were leaving Egypt exiting from Egyptian bondage. Uh, and so you also find delivered uh, 15 times. Uh, and remember, the requirement for faithfulness. Uh, as the Lord commanded Moses, and the punishments that existed within the book, uh, as they did not abide in the commandments of God, um, specifically there if you note chapter 32, the golden calf and the outcomes there. Um, and so how can we understand these major concepts and the overall picture of the book in terms of the New Testament. Well, think about what we find in the New Testament. Number one, do we exit bondage today? Yes. Yes, we do, right? You think about what Jesus states, John 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, again, what chapter is that found in? Chapter 8, we just looked at a few minutes ago. Uh, what's Jesus having a conversation about? Um, again, his deity, who he is, what he's there to do. Uh, we noticed verse 58 a few minutes ago, before Abraham was, I am. What were they trying to claim in that chapter? That they weren't under bondage. They had this idea that they weren't under any kind of oppression. Who were they under at that very time from a political perspective? Rome. So they're not even right there. But not only that, they also had the problem of what? Sin. Uh, and sin enslaved. Sin enslaved. You note, for example, what Paul states in Romans chapter 6, starting there in verse 16. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of 
righteousness. Uh, you've now chosen to be a servant of God uh, because you uh, recognize the bondage of sin. And so um, Exodus, the way out or departure in the book of Exodus, they were exiting Egyptian bondage. Um, and so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and if someone can read for me there, verses 16 and 17. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and uh, actually 16 through 18, just through the end of the chapter there. Okay, and so uh, you find here um, Paul making making an argument concerning um, alignment with God and um, exiting the world, coming out from among them, uh, be separate. Uh, you think about the holy lives that we are to live, uh, is sanctified lives, separate lives. Uh, let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And let's notice what uh, Paul writes there. Um, let's, start, let's start at verse 9. If someone could read verses 9 through 14. 9 through 14 of Colossians 1. Uh, through 14. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Thank you so much. So notice here that uh, they were delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. And so is the church the kingdom? We find that uh, in the affirmative here. It's made, made clear. Um, and you also see the exiting. So you're exiting out of darkness. You're exiting out of being lost. And now you are a citizen of... Uh, of the kingdom of Christ um, as a child of God. And so let's look also kind of the same thought here in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, and this is uh, Paul referencing what it is that his work entailed. Uh, let's read, if someone could read for me, verses 15 through 18. 15 through 18 of Acts 26. All right, thank you so much. So again, that, that exiting, exiting from uh, darkness to light. So you're exiting from darkness, going into light, exiting from the power of Satan uh, to God. Um, and so again, an exit. All right, let's look also 2 Peter chapter 2. We looked at this just a few minutes ago. 
And notice what Peter um, writes, verses 9 and 10. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. If someone could read that for me. Okay. Uh, and so, being delivered... Uh, the godly being delivered, and so, um, again, an exit. Uh, and then also First Peter chapter 2, um, verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now, but are now the people of God, who had obtained mercy, but now, uh, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Mercy, and so again, exiting. Um, and then obviously Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Uh, and so again, that idea of exiting. All right, what about deliverance? What about deliverance? Another word for deliverance is salvation, being saved. Uh, look at what Peter states, Acts chapter 2, starting there in verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And so uh, deliverance, an exit, a deliverance. Again, what we find in the book of Exodus transferred over into the New Testament. The book of Exodus overall, we find an exiting from Egyptian bondage. Uh, we find deliverance um, out of, out of uh, Egyptian bondage. And then also, what about faithfulness? Is it expected? Remember, the Old Testament um, is provided for us so that we may learn. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And so let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and if someone could read for me here, verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 13. Uh, 1 through 13. Moreover, brethren, are we not want you to be unaware that all our fathers under the cloud all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our example, to the intent that we should not lust as he was in, and they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as the others were. As it is written, people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and among those who eat and drive the flesh. Not only let us become Christ, but some of them, some of them also slept, and were destroyed by serpents. For it is plain that some, on, some of them also slept, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things were done as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages will come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands to stand take heed lest he fall. For it's been spoken of those that we have set such an example. If God is faithful, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also but with the temptation will also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Okay, and so he, he makes the argument initially, uh, hey, they all saw the same thing. <laughs> They all were delivered from Egyptian bondage. They all were baptized into Moses in the sense that they were immersed and completely covered in water. You had the cloud above them. You had the Red Sea on either side. Um, they all were being nourished by Christ. Again, we can make parallels for all of those things to the New Testament, as we kind of have already done. 
But yet, some of them, God was not well pleased. They were left in the wilderness. Why? They were unfaithful. They departed from God's commands. They complained. They were idolaters. They were frivolous in their life, unintentional, unpurposeful, living for wickedness. Now, why did all of this take place, Paul states, verse 6 and verse 11? Examples. Examples. Uh, so we look at this book, and what we find is this is what God expects. Does God expect faithfulness? What God tells us here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Absolutely, he does. Uh, any comments or thoughts here on this book? 